It's fair to say that Julia Morris is no overnight success. For more than 20 years, she's been one of Australia's hardest working performers, from stand-up to sketch comedy, corporate gigs and TV appearances. Despite setbacks and heartache, Julia's self-belief and determination to succeed has meant that at the age of 45, she is now at the pinnacle of her profession, starring in a hit TV drama and hosting a national variety show. Peter Overton discovered a performer who proves the adage that you really do make your own luck. Saturday night in Darwin and a sellout crowd has come for Julia Morris. The more nervous I get, the more I swear on the stage, so that'll be a little treat. That's my gauge, is it? Oh. <laughs> for much of her career, stand-up comedy has been her bread and butter. Hands up those who thought, she's nowhere near as fat as she's on the television. Who thought that? <laughs> but such are her TV commitments these days. This is the first time all year she's had to stump up before a crowd like this. Right, we had two years in the US where in two years I earned $1,200, right? So I am huge in the US. <laughs> Some people choose comedy, and comedy chooses some people. So it's not about everyone look at me because I'm so amazing for me. It's about, oh my God, did you hear that laughter in that crowd tonight? That felt fantastic. Three weeks. <laughs> After more than 20 years making people laugh. Thank you. And did I tell you I'm Elvis's sister? <laughs> and at times cry. You said yes. Julia Morris is right back in the spotlight. Look what's happened to your career. Boom, crash, opera. Well, less, less crash, more boom. Absolutely, you know mm. what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the little church on the prairie. Yeah. <laughs> it's all a long way from Gosford on the New South Wales central coast where Julia grew up, raised by parents Michael and Maureen. I know where I get it from. And it's easy to see where Julia's sense of humour comes from. And I'm sure there's yeah. loads of subjects that I bring up in my stand-up that's not every parent's dream come true mm. to sit and yes. watch your daughter say. Like, I, I swear a lot when I'm on stage. Mm. I just do a lot of silent tutting. <laughs> <laughs> you should ride home in the car with her. <laughs> it was a childhood where Julia and brother Brendan were encouraged to shine, to have a go at anything and everything. Julia Morris from New South Wales, holding out for a hero, and she's Act 7. Please make her welcome. But nobody expected the stage to end up as a career. She's a white upon a fiery steam. Until Julia got a break on new faces in 1985, when she was just 17. I thought that being on New Faces would make me the most famous person in the country. And oh, I certainly was at school. <laughs> Everybody watched. But I, um, I was very nervous and it started what became very much a signature of my career is turn up and pretend you can do it. Did it leave you though with a, a real enthusiasm and drive to pursue a career as a performer? It definitely gave me a taste of the big time because I'd worked for Channel 9 and I'd been paid. <laughs> <laughs> Before long, Julia was working full time, leaping from the stage onto the small screen. Oh, what a feeling, <laughs> Thank you very much. And be saying, oh my God, you know. But no, and throughout the 90s, it seemed it there, there was barely a time when Julia wasn't on the telly. <laughs> Julia Morris, welcome Julia. But her force of personality, the very thing that made her so successful, attracted as many critics as fans. Because for years I could never work out why not everybody liked me. I'm like, what's not to like? That, I, I don't understand that But you're bit. quite polarising. So polarising. So polarising, Peter. 50% of people um, loathed me and 50% loved me with the same ferocity and I could never work out why, um, you know, the haters really 
hate it. And have you worked out why it, you were so polarising? A lot of the time when I was being interviewed, I was being the most electric version of myself. But in my defence, it would have been because I was selling a tour. Mm. And there's a certain urgency or desperation, I think, that goes with that. Hey, look, I'm so funny. And oh, look, I pull faces and I'm incredible. When you come to the show, we're all going to laugh and it's going to be amazing. And I think that's what people hated. And since I've let a lot of that go, because I'm maybe more relaxed now in my 40s, and I'm like, this is what it is, babes. By the end of the 90s, the work had dried up. So Julia moved to the UK in search of success. She expected to be an instant smash, but found herself once again at the bottom of the comedy circuit. I came crashing down to earth in the UK where nobody cared if I lived or died. If I wasn't out on the stage at night, I wasn't eating. And for a lot of that time in the UK, I was very broke, but Peter, I'd done Massive farewells, this is me going, I'm leaving, here I go, I'm on the plane, I'm a huge star, I'm going. Everyone knew about it. Everybody knew, so four months in, when I was really broke and living in a tiny flat somewhere in the outskirts of London, I couldn't come back. Americans make things that are very, very big. Which nation makes things that are very, 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 very small? Japanesey! Japanese, right. Eventually, Julia Japanese. found success. Japanese. <laughs> I apologise to everybody Japanese watching. Both professionally and personally. <laughs> I stand here, this is like my desk. I'm like, out of the way, everyone, out of my spot. <laughs> and now, a decade later, in a case of life imitating art, husband Dan Thomas is the stay-at-home dad for their two children. I help all the rest of the time. Very helpful. Yes. Mirroring Julia's on-screen relationship in House Husband. But I'm thrilled that she's having such professional success now and, you know, and really enjoying it as well, which is, which is great. So, you know, I don't think her career well, could get can much more fun. I keep my wife in the style that he likes to be accustomed <laughs> to, Peter. <laughs> but for much of their time together, it's been hand-to-mouth. When Julia and Dan tried their luck in Los Angeles, she just couldn't get any work and was told bluntly her weight was the issue. It's as simple as that. And uh, I started the next day on, you know, not eating carbs and cut out a lot of um, processed sugars. And ironically, I started to get much better and higher profile auditions. So what they were saying, you were invisible? Absolutely. Either put on a lot of weight or take off, because you are invisible at the size that you're at. <laughs> but then Julia received a call from Australia that would prove to be a game-changer. Well, the cheque doesn't belong to our team and it needs to come off our total. It needs to go to the other team. I came home for Apprentice accidentally and all of a sudden Australian audiences, not just people in the street approaching me saying, I had no idea that you were like that. I had television executives who'd known me for years saying, I didn't know that you were like that. Say yes or I'll jump. Oh, oh my God, get down After Celebrity me. Apprentice, uh, the career really reignited, oh, didn't it? Did, did you expect a role like Gemma in House Husband? I didn't have great expectations uh, off the back of Apprentice. And then the audition came up for House Husbands and the call came that night. I was like, what do you mean? The calls come that night, what? And, they, oh, and of course, the offer was for um, to play Gary's wife, I'm like, do I get to kiss Gary Sweet on the lips? <laughs> OK, let's crunch the deal. <laughs> Is he a good kisser? Sensational. How's Dan feel? Oh, Dan loves it. He just goes straight to the bank account. <laughs> <laughs> Having settled back in Australia, life was good. But then Dan's doctor delivered news that he could never have seen coming. He said, you've got something called ductal carcinoma in situ, which is um, a, a small breast cancer in your breast. So you've got to come in and have a mastectomy. Um, but, you know, it was Wednesday and he said, what are you doing? What are you doing Thursday or Friday? And we were kind of like, oh. You don't think of men very often being diagnosed with breast cancer, do no, you? No, I mean, a lot of people, you say that to people, they don't believe, they don't believe me you know, because I don't think men can get it. And it's, and I think it's only, I think one in every 1,500 breast cancers is, 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 is in men. So it's pretty, it's pretty small. Did that floor you both? Yeah. Mm. You know, I knew that there's lots and lots of positive stories, but I'm like, here's this 
this person without whom my life just simply, I feel, wouldn't continue in this wonderful, happy way and says, you've got breast cancer and it needs to come off. And you're like, well, okay, let's, in the same way that I do tick list stuff, let's dig it off and get it sorted out. There's still that moment while we were driving back where, like, we were horrified. The urgency, Julia, of, of having the mastectomy, did that drive your mind to the urgency of, well, I could lose oh, yeah. my husband here? At 100%, that's your instant thought, because, you know, whatever we know in our minds about survival rates of cancer and how terrific they are, this is not everybody else, this is us. Mm. So we're just so lucky, we yeah. feel really lucky. That's the, I'd say lucky is the main word we would use in reference to it, because, you know, you get that sense of yeah, how much worse it is for most other people. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we were very lucky. And um, Dan started uh, saying that we have to embrace those moments now when those Absolutely. great moments are happening in your family. You're not allowed to let them pass you by. There's too many, there's too many bad bits in life, so when a great bit comes along, we need time to stop and just go, that's fantastic. How good's that? Mm. Well, <laughs> as they say, this isn't a two-rack tractor. It's certainly not. In fact, These days, settled in Melbourne, life certainly is fantastic. When I turn up to do all the shopping in it, all you have to do is pull up this little thing at the back and it turns into a trolley. <laughs> That's how tiny it is. Well, this looks fantastic. Yeah. Let me help. I like it. And for Dan, the health outlook is great. The surgeons have given him the all clear. Get up out of the bed, yeah. or I will make you get up out of the bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While Julia's career continues to fly, possibly doing less, but certainly achieving more. What's the perception of you now in 2013, as opposed to the perception back in the 90s? People seem very happy for what's happened for me over the last three years. So I would like the perception to be that I've let go of a lot of stuff and I'm just happy being myself. I'm so happy just turning up. Whereas in the 90s, I would have thought that the perception of me is that it was I was quite desperate, I think, and perhaps I was. I didn't feel desperate. I've had a very good time. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.